I'm Britt Bingold, and you are listening to Season 3 of Learning Unlocked. Educators are the key holders to unlocking learning for students. Today, as always, my goal is to provide you with resources and tools the keys to enable and accelerate learning for all students. Thanks for joining me today. Let's get started. Hey, key holders, welcome back to Learning Unlocked. Today I'm engaging in what I believe is a very important conversation, and it is regarding how teachers instruct their students. I am joined by my fellow instructional specialists in our district, Wendy Peterson and Julia Salsi. We have been working our way through year one of a rollout in our district of an instructional framework. If you have been following along with this series in the podcast, we have so far discussed Connect, which is about making those relationships with our students, and Design, which is honing in on what goes into high quality lesson design versus lesson planning. But today, Today is where the rubber meets the road. Instruction is when we take our relationships with students and leverage our lesson designs in order to instruct them in a way that is clear, intentional, and engaging. And as you hear in this episode, we are very passionate about the impact quality instruction has on student learning. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome. Welcome back to Learning Unlocked. Today we are recording episode 29 and I am welcoming back my colleagues Julia Salsi and Wendy Peterson to discuss our instruct module of the framework. If you haven't listened to the other episodes before this, you can totally go back. They have the words um, design and connect in bold or uh, uh, not bold girls. What am I trying to say? Uppercase, I guess. Yes. Um, that you can go and it's a series that we're doing based on our district framework initiative. Good morning, ladies. Good Hi. morning. And even though it's Gilbert district, mm-hmm. it, it's applicable to anybody. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's why we're putting it on the podcast because right. as we've gone through and done some things with teachers and principals and it's rolling out throughout our district. We felt it was definitely worthwhile to get out to everyone. So we have done an episode about connections with students and building relationships. We've done an episode about designing lessons. And so today we're going to talk about our favorite thing as instructional specialists, instruct. So the first concept of that domain, the instruct domain, um, is teacher clarity. And we talked about teacher clarity in the last podcast. Um, So what we have to do now is define what teacher clarity is and is not, especially in this um, realm of instruct versus design. So what is teacher clarity with instruct? So when we talked about teacher clarity during the design component of the framework, we were really talking about teacher clarity in regards to the teachers, how clear the teachers were on what they were teaching and why they were teaching it. As we now dive into teacher clarity in the instruct domain, we're talking about how clear the students are on what they're doing and why they are doing it. Um, So really, we're now going to dive into can the students tell us what they're doing, why they're doing it, um, and how are they going to know when they get it? Uh, because they they need to be able to articulate that Mm -hmm. through whatever strategies or instruction that you're using. They have to be able to tell you why they think they're doing those things. Wendy, what is teacher clarity not? (laughs) Well, first of all, teacher clarity is not putting an objective or anything else up um, and assuming that that will just naturally sink in <laughs> <Osmosis>. that osmosis. <laughs> um, I've been at some classrooms also where it's written so teeny, teeny, tiny that I've had to literally, and this is not because I'm old, walk <laughs> right up to the board to look at it. Right. And so the teacher um, thinks that he or she has done it mm-hmm. and checked it off the list because it's on the board. So it, it, it's not just putting it up because your principal told you you needed to and never uh, referring and to it never again. referring to it or doing anything with that. Yeah, it's an I, I see clarity as a strategy 
in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Um, There are things that you are planning to do with clarity maps or whatever the, however you, you you're organizing your learning intentions, your learning targets, um, your success criteria, you are planning to have students do specific things with those Mm -hmm. as part of the instruction process. Okay. Well, and, and so uh, people who've taken my classes have sometimes um, heard me refer to when I was uh, modeling in, it was a kindergarten or first grade classroom, and I was in there for about an hour and a half, and one of the teachers watching me decided to tally how many times I went back to that day's I can statement mm-hmm. and had the kids say it and um, move with it and talk about what are we doing right now and how does it go back to that. And I think it added up to, it was like 30 times in an hour and a half. Now that's probably overkill. Um, I'll admit that, Um, but it's way better than here it is in little teeny tiny lettering on the board and never referring to it. Or just Mm -hmm. saying even at the beginning of a lesson and then just moving on. Yeah, and Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that just, that doesn't work either. No. Um, You know, today we're going to learn about finding the main idea and then we just move on. Right. No. That you're not going to get any effect. That's size not from really that. the the teacher clarity that we uh, want to focus no. on, right? And we think will help teachers and kids, correct? Whoever you are, wherever you are. <laughs> so okay, so let's then move to okay, teacher clarity. We know what it is. We know what it's not. We talked about it in the last podcast. But what does this student version of teacher clarity look like in practice? What would the teacher be seeing? What would the students be doing? How would the room look? Um, That type of thing. Well, I would see students regularly reflecting on what they're, what they're, whatever it is that they're working on, um, reflecting on how they're doing um, against the success criteria, against the learning targets of the day. I would see students having a copy of some type of clarity map or right. learning goals and scales, something that articulates for them what those learning targets are, what success um, is described as, or um, even better, what success looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, especially when you're talking about littles who aren't, who aren't reading, right. you're going to be able to see some of that model work. I want to hear kids being able to say, you know, I can do this and this, but I can't do this because, Mm -hmm. and my next steps are to this. And that really makes kids um, partners Mm -hmm. in the learning process rather than, yeah, rather than just passive onlookers. They're a, they're a part of their learning process because they're articulating as much as the teacher is what they can and can't do. And, you know, sometimes we feel like we have to, um, go full in. And so if you need to start with um, just having kids being able to say what they're learning and why. Yeah. And then after they have that, then move into some of those um, deeper deeper questions that Julia just talked about. And so I was very clear. Remember, I don't believe in keeping secrets from kids. So I was really clear with my students. Mm -hmm. Somebody could walk in here and it happened all the time. Somebody could walk in here and come to you and say, what are you learning? Mm -hmm. Why are you learning it? Uh, You got to be able to answer that question and not just in a rote way, but in a deeper understanding way. The other thing I used to have students do, and this was way before I had the good influence of Julia and Brett, um, they had to write down the I don't even know what we called it back then, but like the objective or the I yeah. can statement, mm-hmm. they had to write it down. They've been called so many different things. Uh, they have been, <laughs> and especially if you've been around as long as I have. But then they also had to um, rate themselves at the end of the lesson on effort mm-hmm. and then how well they understood the concept. And so it's just a one to four yeah. scale on both. But that allowed me to have a conversation with them about how clear they were on what we were learning and what progress they were making. So I always look to see something like that where students are interacting with um, the the learning target or the goals or wherever you are in this journey. Um, For teachers that are unclear about, because we talk about learning goals and targets and success criteria, and for teachers that are unclear about what those things are, can we do like a quick, maybe 
definition of what we are, define those things to be and then um, kind of how we came up because you mentioned clarity map. And mm-hmm. so people listening might be like, what? Sounds lovely. Yeah. What, what is that? Is that? <laughs> so I just want to make sure we're, you know, if it's, it's not a visual podcast, um, it's an audio. So how can we describe that in a way? That they will understand I was going to it better. Out, but yeah. then when you said that, yeah, it's, yeah that might not I work. Think that's and work. I'm going to defer to Julia. I always tell people I run into, yes, I understand it, but Julia is the guru. So here she is. Right. Bum, I will do my best without um, having a visual aid. <laughs> so, Use it. so the most Your important thing eye. I know yeah. the most important thing we do with students is teach them the priority skills of our content area but our, or series of content areas. So we take the priority standards or a priority standard um, and we create a learning goal. And that learning goal is a student-friendly version of that priority standard. We always, um, we teach it that it starts with, I am learning to. Mm-hmm. So it becomes that answer, what are you doing? Um, or it becomes the answer to why are you doing it? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the, the big the big overarching goal. It's the learning goal. And that's something that you're taking um, a series of days, if not a couple of weeks, to achieve mastery on. Then we take that learning goal and we break it down into the success criteria. What will it mean to be successful um, with that learning goal? And those become the I can statements taken directly from the priority standard. So we using... don't take the st- we don't take the statements from the learning goal that we've created that's in student friendly language. No. Okay. We we mean we retain the language of the standard yeah. for the success criteria. The point of the learning goal is it just it, we want it to be something that the students can repeat easily when when asked. Right. Um, what we do is we then take the success criteria and we place it in a three column chart, mm-hmm. and the success criteria gets placed in the third column, and we call that the got it column. Um, then we back up and we write the learning targets that we're gonna hit along the way to get to that success criteria. And those are the series of I can statements. We have starting out I can statements, we have on my way I can statements, and then we hit the success criteria, which is the got it. And we call that three column chart our clarity map. So we have a priority standard that becomes a learning goal. Um, We then take from the standard, we determine what the success criteria is, that becomes our got it column. And then we have learning targets for the starting out and on my way. So, and for the listeners, I'm going to link an, a sample um, in the show notes so that you guys can see that um, when you guys go to the website. But it's very similar to Marzano's um, learning goals and scales. And then we kind of mixed it with some John Hattie effect sizes. And it kind of just became this thing yeah. um, that we call a clarity map because really it's not a rubric. It's not anything to be used as grading, mm-hmm. um, but it does provide students and teachers as they create them real clarity mm-hmm. on what is happening in the classroom. Well, and I always talk about it as it becomes the conversation language between the student and the teacher. It becomes yes. a way for the nice student dialogue. to talk to the teacher about what they can or can't do. Um, which would have been enormously helpful for me as a struggling math student. Mm-hmm. Um, my parents always said, well, are you asking questions? I'm like, uh, no, because I don't know what questions to ask. Right. A clarity map would have helped me do that. And also, Brett, you were saying about um, not a rubric. So I think a lot of people, oh, you want a rubric. Mm-hmm. No, I don't want it. So a rubric would be more for a product Product. of some kind Mm -hmm. um this which would be generally a a summative assessment a clarity map is for learning along the way right so keep that in mind yes there are similarities between them but they aren't the same yeah there's no points assigned to the i can statements and i think that's really important for teachers to see Mm -hmm. Um, and you can definitely do formative assessments on the i can statements but they don't need to it's not you're not using the actual clarity map as a rubric but i think it's definitely an amazing tool and i definitely want to um, link that for those who don't have the um, access to it so as we move into um concept two which is intentional instruction and we're talking about clarity so let's bring some clarity here all right let's clarify first what do we mean by putting the word intentional in front of the word instruction well Let's go back to the clarity map, right? We have these learning targets that we're trying to hit along the way to 
the success criteria, whether that's objectives and um, that you use, whatever you're, whatever you're Goals, trying, to, whatever, yeah, you're... whatever skill you're trying to have <laughs> them master that particular day. Um, intentional means that you are choosing a high yield strategy because you believe it to be, or you know it from past experience to be the most effective strategy to use with that skill with those students. Yeah. And we talked about high yield strategies in pod, in the last podcast that we did with design. So go ahead and, and look back and I've linked um, high yield strategies to that podcast. But really, that's where you're being intentional in that, that lesson planning design. And then you're pulling it into your instruction. So these two really do connect very well together, design and instruct, because you, you, right, you can't do one without the other. Yeah. Okay, so, but now we need to even go further. So <laughs> we've got intentional instruction, which is under the category of direct instruction, right? No, it's not. Direct instruction is under the category became, of intentional I instruction. I became British quite all, all of a sudden. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> my arrows on my sheet didn't work. So, but direct instruction. Honestly, we just want to talk about the difference between intentional instruction, direct instruction, and lecture. Yes. Because those three things, honestly, no matter how wrong I just said that, are the three things that I think even us get confused with, and I think teachers get confused with, and I think they need to be separated out of it. So, what is the difference between direct instruction and lecture? Let's go with that first. Well, first, let's just get rid of the traditional lecture. Okay. That's the first thing I want to say. I'm just jumping in there. I've um, heard several master teachers. Yes. Very, say lecture quite often still. Mm. is part of their normal vernacular. Well, but then they're not master teachers. What do you mean by mm. master teachers? I want to say, like I want to say, old timers. No, I oh, want to say okay. people that are doing things in education now that seem current, like, um, not obviously a Marzano and Hattie, but p people of that type of caliber that are still using lecture in their um, books or in their podcast episodes and I really it it makes me twitch every time I hear it well I, I wish that your listeners our listeners could see my face I wish they could too um because like my chin's dropped down to the table mm -hmm. so but it makes uh, me literally like well, my and, skin and, crawls every and time I'm gonna I hear it. turn it over to Julia again really this should have been her podcast <laughs> and I should be sitting <laughs> in my office no it shouldn't no. peanut butter cups or something <laughs> so yeah if we just lecture if we're really good, we're entertaining and interesting and captivating, mm -hmm. and that's just awesome, Right. but it's not the best way to teach kids. That doesn't mean that you can't, as the teacher, talk and not be all those things, but, but there's so much more to helping students learn. Um, I don't think, I mean, I've sat, you know, with lots of keynote speakers and such, and I don't think that without interaction, you re you, you retain some bits and pieces, mm -hmm. but not enough to make it learning. Because I think, really quick, just to be devil's advocate, oh yeah, um, there's a lot of storytellers that are very good, and they consider their lectures to be valuable because they're telling stories and storytelling is can be an effective strategy so i think that's where the um the feeling like lecture is a valid piece of educational pedagogy still is in the conversation rendy's raising her hand at me <laughs> i'm just i had to i'm bringing this up because i really do feel like it's important yes uh, i teach a class on um what's called a, a public narrative by Gans, G-A-N-Z. I think he's a Harvard professor. Um, I didn't plan to talk about this, but when I teach that class, I, I use all sorts of quotes on the power of storytelling. Storytelling is extraordinarily powerful. And I believe the best teachers are in fact really good storytellers. 
but that is not the be all and end all. And even with what Gantz talks about in public narrative, which originally was created for um, uh, like protesting, uh -huh. um, disseminating really that is like a, a 10 minute cycle um, divided into three parts about how to tell a good story. That is not about, I'm going to tell a really great story for the next hour and a half. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, Julia, you go now because you got this. I know. No, and that I really, I, I asked you obviously devil's advocate because I understand that you teach that. And I like that you said it's a cycle because that goes right yeah. very well into what we're talking about. Right. Yeah. So when we say don't lecture, so many teachers take that to mean don't talk <laughs> at all, at right. all. And they, and they panic. They're like, well, I have stuff I need to teach the kids. Well, direct instruction and is higher on yeah. body's scale, and so they're and confused. So, right. And so lecture implies that you are speaking the entire time frame that you are given. Direct instruction means that you are speaking in bursts. You are conveying information in a certain amount of time um, or you are demonstrating or modeling a skill in an amount of time that whatever each student you have is able to follow along with you. Um, and then you are stopping and you are giving the students the opportunity to actively engage in whatever you just gave them. It's, it's really giving them the time to move things from the short term into the long-term memory mm -hmm. um, and to process and to make room in that frontal, is it the prefrontal cortex? Yes. I'm so bad with the name. Yes. Up front, my for, if you could see my language with my and, forehead right and, now. Language and development processing. Um, yeah, so that can only hold so much. Yep. And if you don't provide students the opportunity to file that away in some way, shape, or form by engaging with it, um, by making neural connections to things that already exist in their brain, um, it goes away. And so I always tell teachers, you, a good gauge is your student's age in minutes. Um, that's about as long as they can, can follow along with story, whatever story you're telling um, or with whatever you're modeling for them. Now, what's really nice is the littles mm -hmm. will show you they're done, mm -hmm. that they can't follow oh, you anymore. Well, they show <laughs> they're, you. they're literally falling out of their chairs or, or rolling on the floor, rolling on the floor, wandering the room, picking their nose, crying, yeah. whatever, mm -hmm. doing, doing the potty dance, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, but slowly as we progress into school, we get very good at the, the affect of school, mm -hmm. the physical affect of school. Um, and so we can nod and smile like the best of them mm -hmm. and our brains can go completely wherever, yep, wherever they want. So when we talk about direct instruction, what we're really talking about a short burst mm -hmm. of information or a modeling of a skill. And then the students doing some type of active learning experience. Um, and active learning experience means that they're engaged, they're thinking, they're making connections. They're really trying to move that information into the part of the memory where they can recall it later. Mm -hmm. um, and the only way they can do that is if they build those neural pathways by doing with it. Um, and I come back to the idea of storytelling, which I love. Um, storytelling, I, I think though, and this is in my humble opinion, uh -oh. um, is phenomenal. I can remember all my storytelling teachers and I remember being enthralled and I can remember what they told the stories about. Um, but that was just it. I had knowledge, but I didn't know what to do with that knowledge. Yeah. yeah. So storytelling was great at giving me knowledge to remember, but it wasn't great at showing me what to do with that. And so if we can harness the power of storytelling with active learning experiences, I think we have the most phenomenal lesson possible. Absolutely amazing. See, this is why I ask questions like this, because then beautiful things happen and it makes me so happy. It's, a, it's exciting, really. Mm -hmm. it, it's exciting. So, and especially with our secondary teachers who tend to be more lecturers, we're not saying to toss that baby out with the bathwater. No. We're just saying, stop. Think a little bit about let what the, you're doing. And let your students jump in. Do well, something with it. And, oh, Julia. Oh, and not just take notes. Oh, yeah. No. It's not, oh. Oh yeah, Julia. Okay, we're gonna. Julia. I think. Well, I think we're gonna get to that okay, a little yeah, bit okay, later. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry. I just. You know. I you had a moment that. of panic. <laughs> yeah. I had a moment Maybe of I panic. should record these live. Maybe we should make these YouTube lives. Okay. <laughs> oh, that would be fun. No. Too <laughs> <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> so, there's no editing out. There's it's no editing there. So no. Okay. So 
Um, with the, um, st- oh no, I lost my train of thought. Oh, it's so fine. It's totally okay. Um, we'll move on to the next question and maybe I'll think of it. But um, I think that's a good idea of marrying the storytelling and the intentional instruction with um, direct instruction, those short bursts. Oh, I remember it. Julia, you and I were talking about uh, boosting student retention because the rate of learning loss after you say it is very drastic. What Do you remember the... Oh, shoot, man. Not, I don't remember the number, but it was drastic. As it's soon drastic. as you say something, I think within a few minutes, it's it could be gone. I feel like I feel like it was something like fifteen, but there's a um, it's, it's called the forgetting curve. Yeah, um, we'll link. I'll link to it. it. Yeah, um, I'll provide that for you. But it's called the forgetting curve, and it's really powerful. You can um, search. There's quite a few mm-hmm. videos on it that demonstrate it. It's but not a happy. It's, it's really, not a happy thing as yeah. a teacher to watch because you're like, I'm saying all of this, and this is how much how much they're forgetting. Right. How about how how little they're remembering? That is exactly. Well, and, that, and and it's um it's very fa- it's actually I find it very fascinating, mm-hmm. and it talks about how if they just reengage with it, um every you know 15, 20 minutes, minutes. you can actually reduce that Forgetting substantially. Mm-hmm. So that's why the short bursts and the the right. cycle mm-hmm. of yeah. Instruction short burst, instruction short burst is so important. And that's what I kind of, I wanted to jump in and, and well, just I'm mention that. A little bit of a kind of an old teacher joke, although it's not funny. You know, um, I taught them that. Yeah. Uh, okay. If that means that you said it to mm-hmm. them and they didn't remember, you didn't actually teach them you anything. Told them you something. Told them something. Mm-hmm. So when you were saying that about the the forgetting curve, and I would just like to add that if you're 57, that forgetting curve <laughs> is really, really bad. It's well, yeah, it's bad for all of us actually. Yeah, I know. But, um, mm-hmm. the parent brain causes okay, yeah. the forgetting oh, curve please, too. Wait till you're old. And chronic um, illness brain. Yeah, we well, we're, we're we're super great here. But yeah, one of the other things that I found really fascinating when we talk about instruction and retention, I just have to jump in because I've yep. just been reading on this is the power instructionally of con- giving students the opportunity to connect new knowledge to knowledge they've already mastered. Amen. It's kind of like the difference in the brain between when they go to recall something new, having to take the surface streets to get to it oh, nice. versus if, it, if they were able to connect it to something they've already mastered and know, they get like a highway I like to that recall analogy. the information. Ooh. And so I, that's, I found that very fascinating. So anything that you can do to connect to prior knowledge. Because you're building stronger dendrites in the mm-hmm. brain, which, yeah, that yeah. It, neurologically pathway-wise, you're mm-hmm. getting a highway yeah. instead of yeah. surface streets. I love mm-hmm. that. Okay, awesome. So let's follow up now because the only, is it the only uh, instructional strategy in the top, like in five? In our top, I yeah, think. Yeah, really. Only it's, one. It's the only my I'm now I'm going through my little file cabinet in my brain. Um, it really is the only let's test the forgetting curve. Truly <laughs> instructional strategy. That's yeah. what I think it, too, it, right? It, 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 it's a drop after a one. Mm-hmm. Okay, so where we start getting other strategies. Yeah. Yes, I think so. So this is one. the only one over one on if we're looking at visible learning. John Hattie and he talks about it is in terms of the potential to considerably accelerate student learning. The strategy is Jigsaw, and it's a a 1.2. And I really want to bring Jigsaw back to life. I feel like somehow along the way, we buried it. Um, And I think it needs to be risen from the dead. And I'm going to throw this to Wendy because she teaches an amazing class on it. But were either of you surprised when you first ever found out about John Hattie? Were you like Jigsaw? Or were you like, oh, yeah, Jigsaw? Like, what was oh. your original thing? I'm just going to confess that I was like, Jigsaw? Okay. Me it too. was not – I think I was that generation going through my my teacher prep program that it had been around for a little while. <laughs> Wendy's not going to – she's not going to talk to me. Thank goodness I brought in chocolate today. Um, <laughs> that I, I – yeah, I just thought it's – first of all, I, I think I, I thought it's so simple. Like really? Like how is this the highest? Uh, yeah, of all of them? yeah, and mm-hmm. and I think again we were of the generation going to teacher prep that you know technology was kind of in, at the forefront yeah, totally. of education. It, people were really trying to figure out how that wove into teaching and learning, mm-hmm. and so a lot of the focus was there. And what was popular prior to that was kind of getting pushed aside and thrown out, and 
And so, um, so I was, I was surprised, um, knowing what I know now from my brilliant colleague, Wendy, um, <laughs> trying to redeem yourself. I understand now why it's so high. <laughs> yes. Um, I think I was the same with Julia. I was like jigsaw. And then all of a sudden something fired in my brain, which I learned I, way after my teacher prep program was this unit we did on Tim Burton. And we watched mm -hmm. several of his clips of his videos and the students wrote an essay about his style and the entire unit was jigsaw class. Okay. Yeah. And it was over and over and over yeah. and over and over. And I remember those being the best conversations, yeah. the best discussions my students have ever had about how a technique mm -hmm. can impact purpose, audience, persona, uh, imagery, whatever. And so I think that was the only reason I wasn't mm -hmm. surprised by it. My initial reaction was, what? And then I remembered that unit that mm -hmm. we used to do. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, those were the best essays I ever mm -hmm. had was when I used Jigsaw almost for an entire unit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, Wendy, are you ready? No, because you people have said it all. And I um, We have not even talked about what creates a, the official 1.2. And I, I people would, mess it up all the time. I'm girl. glad that Julia made her confession publicly because if it had been privately, nobody would find her body. <laughs> <laughs> Except that she, she, she did confess and, and ask for forgiveness. So because I love her, right, well, we, can, we can move on. I've used Jigsaw forever because it was popular when I went to college in the Stone Age. It is, um, however, something that teachers have used and abused mm -hmm. because it does take longer. So if you're still focused on, I have to cover mm. um, American history from 1492 to 2021, yeah, you're not going to be able to do the jigsaw. If you're focused on skills, then Jigsaw is yep. your way to go. Your best friend, your honestly. Your best friend. Well, and, and so we have to remember that with Jigsaw, you're normally dividing up some kind of a text. And in my class, I say it really is nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to do Jigsaw <laughs> with a fictional text. And teachers' faces go... Oh. oh, you mean I can't give the kids right. the end of the story and right. expect oh, them to understand what's it happening? It does not work to say you did chapter one in the Charlotte's yeah. Web, you did chapter two in Charlotte's yeah, Web. Yeah, and then like one kid in the corner is crying with right. our group and the kids are like, what's going to happen? Yeah, right. that's not good. So, so it, it, there are way, it's more like reciprocal teaching blended with Jigsaw mm -hmm. if you... Boy, that's all another podcast. Yeah, but that, let's not bring that, that up. That can be done with... Um, <laughs> fiction with little children i y you can do some jigsaw e mm -hmm. things so you have to have a text mm -hmm. it needs to be divided up relatively equally although you can differentiate this way too mm -hmm. by giving a simpler text to struggling students without them knowing it's a simpler text of course um so students usually on their own, but there are ways to mix it up, usually on their own would begin reading the text. You would have some sort of activity with that, even if it's some sort of note-taking strategy, focus, uh, answers to questions. And then students would need to go into an expert group. Now, this is the part that teachers most often leave out mm -hmm. because it takes more time. You have to get up and move. So students need to get up and move. And if I read the section on Alexander Hamilton, I would be getting with all the other people who read the section on Alexander Hamilton. Mm -hmm. If Julia read about Thomas Jefferson, she'd go meet with the other Thomas Jeffersons. Um, and if Brit, um, let's say, ooh, Hercules Mulligan, she was learning all about him. How did you know he was my favorite? Then she would be headed with the Hercules Mulligan people. Right. We would then make sure that, that whatever focus the teacher gave, that all of us got there. And we would add to each other's knowledge. And this, um, in and of itself, is a way to differentiate. Because even students who tend to be better readers better thinkers can get things from students who um, struggle a little bit more. So they need, they ensure that their knowledge is sound and correct. They're actually experts. They're, they become experts. Right. 
And if I couldn't get the answer to a question or didn't understand some part, this is where I say to the other folks in my group, hey, you guys, I, I don't understand this part. Right. And somebody there will help me understand it. And it's okay. Of course, you've set a structure in your classroom that means it's a safe place, mm -hmm. that mistakes are not only accepted, but valued. So after I truly am an expert, then I go back to my home group. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm meeting with the Alexander Hamiltons and the Thomas Jeffersons and the Hercules Mulligans. Oh, and somebody's doing John Lawrence too. Okay. We come back together right. and we, with whatever structure really the teacher wants us to use, we share that information with each other, usually as some sort of a group product. Right. However, and here's the other part that teachers forget about, there has to be individual accountability. So if I only become an expert on um, Hamilton, yeah. but I don't know anything about Jefferson. Or what, you just what's briefly wrote point? down something about Jefferson oh, right. from your share. Right, right. Oh, right. So yeah. I wrote it down, but... So there has to be some sort of um, synthesis or processing that allows everybody to learn. Now, that that does not happen in a 40-minute class period. Mm -mm. Okay, no. And that's the other thing is teachers want something that they can do in 45 minutes mm -hmm. from beginning to end and be done. Mm -hmm. okay. When I did Jigsaw with my students, we might be working on something for a week or more. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they process it together. They synthesize it together. But ultimately, they have to, to go with the learning on their own. Right. They have to be responsible for all of the parts. Something. But they still have their expert group um, as a scaffold. And then they have their home group as a, a scaffold. I often say everything we used to call cheating, we now call learning. Mm -hmm. Like, don't look at anybody else's paper. Don't talk to anybody else. Yeah. Now I'm saying, look at your neighbor. <laughs> See what <laughs> your neighbor did. Yeah. If you don't understand this, grab the person across from you. Right. And so those are all the benefits, that one point to effect size of Jigsaw. Clearly, I get passionate about this. Um, and I want to remind teachers, you don't do it one time in September. And then and be go, like, Woo -hoo, I'm getting I my considerably one accelerated two. my students' learning. Right. It's something consistent. And it is um, something that students eventually manage more on their mm -hmm. own. Theoretically in high school and in college, mm -hmm. students can do this on their own. So they have a study group for a class and some awful old professor who's just they do. mumbling along. Then you go, okay, okay. you take Alexander Hamilton, yeah. you take her, you know, I'm going to take We did John this in college Lawrence, all the time. Right? Yeah. And so teaching it to kindergartners mm -hmm. and on up is a way to help them know how to do it on their own. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Okay, i got to have a drink of coffee now. And that's why I wanted to go over, and that was really it. the bulk of this section was if we're talking about instruct as a podcast topic, we got to talk about these different words that we hear. Direct instruction, lecture, jigsaw, intentional instruction, da, da, da. like there's just so many words that it's like, okay, I got to make sense of all of these in my brain somehow and how they apply to my kids in my, in my classroom. Just come take my class. Even if you don't teach you Gilbert. Sure, they'll see me. fly across the country and come see you. I would love that. I know or, you would. Or they could fly me across oh, the country. Oh, there you go. To them. There, there. She's <laughs> plugging her own self. There's, that's you what betcha. she's doing. <laughs> All right. Especially if you're in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> so, part of teacher clarity intentional instruction is formulating questions through higher order questioning. Um, and so this was like the buzzword, I feel like, before um, differentiation. I feel like it was like everything was about higher order questioning. You got to have higher order questioning. You got to have critical thinking skills. You got to get that. And I just, I want to flesh out what it means and how it should be used in the classroom. And I want to talk about both how teachers should use higher order questioning, but how also students should be using higher order questioning. They're both looking at me now. Well, well, I just had, I just had a thought when you said buzzword because there are so many. I know that we should did do you, like a, a did bingo. you just swirl? Yes, yeah, <laughs> we should do a bingo board, and I may do it for the group that I'm going to see oh, this so Thursday. She, so she just but went you, off onto a lesson plan. You write, yeah, you write down all the buzzwords, and In every education. time I say one, you cross it you off, cross it off, off and That's... yell bingo because or Hattie or something. Something because done. it gets confusing, and I think teachers are like, I've heard this before, right. and I know how. To do a higher order question right and then we say all the time higher order thinking yeah um, metacognitive strategies um 
I just want to back up and say, uh -oh. if you are, if, if we go back to that idea of direct instruction, mm -hmm. you're giving them some new form of information yes. or modeling some new skill. Mm -hmm. And then you are giving them time to actively engage in that. Mm -hmm. Engagement to me comes through higher order thinking. Mm -hmm. And so when you're creating those activities that could be a question, um, it, yes. that, that promotes thinking that they're discussing that they're there's, and it's something I don't. Okay. But it's not, here's what's not to me. It's not who's the main character of the story. Well, no, yeah, no. <laughs> like I just no, that's no. no. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not joking though. Like I, I, that's I'm, a question, right? That's and not a. That's not that's a question not a higher, that promotes higher, higher order thinking. thinking or complex conversations right. or discussion. No. no. Um, and so, like, we kind of move away from those like study guiding questions. Well, that they're not important. We need to know those things. But like, where are the? It's scary, I think, for some teachers to pose questions that don't have concrete one answers. concrete yes, answer. I think that's absolutely and so, oh. it. <laughs> and so I think that's where we end up with some of those study guides. Yes. Uh, I was the queen of study guides. So was I. By the way. Until Julia, she a, told me I couldn't use them anymore. I panicked. I made, I made killer study guides. If any of my former students are listening, they rock, didn't they? Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> She's a boss right now. <laughs> We've all used study guides. Oh. Okay, but go yeah. more on to what, what does it sound like? Let's flesh it out. Like, what does a higher order question sound like? To me, a higher order question... Uh, requires some type of comparison. Okay. It requires some type of connection mm -hmm. um, to prior knowledge. So like some blooms, some... Yeah, but I think Julia said it earlier. It, it's a question where there isn't an answer that is readily available. Yeah. Could be mm -hmm. abstract. Maybe like a metaphor. And, uh, and it involves putting... It involves synthesis. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. It includes analysis first. We're going to take whatever True. this is apart mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we're going to look Break at all those parts, parts. Yeah. and we're going to put it back together and then we're going to look at something else's parts and put it back together. And then we're going to take those two, three, four, 12 things that we've studied their parts and synthesize them in some way. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, mm -hmm. am I yeah. right? I've never thought about it like that, but yeah. Well, I think it's just a matter of taking, like, let's mm -hmm. go to a standard study guide question. Yeah. Describe Atticus Finch. Right. Right. That's yeah. a standard. You might see that. It's yeah. not a question, Ooh, but it's an action. Yeah. Right. Right. And I'm going to um, write more than one or two words, so it must yeah. be a great question. So a different way to approach that that requires higher order thinking um, could be you could provide them a quote by Teddy Roosevelt nice. or, um, and then explain how Atticus exemplifies or does not exemplify the points made in that quote. In that quote. You could take something, some other text that you'd read that year. Um, Friar, Friar Lawrence. Yeah. Um, how are Atticus Finch and Friar Lawrence alike and different? They're having to retrieve and and they're, they're having to break the parts. Yes. Stronger. Yeah. Building mm -hmm. those information superhighways um, in their brain. Yeah. And I think so it's so it really is a matter of taking the questions you're already asking as a teacher and turning them into, first of all, those are much more interesting questions as a student to answer. I'm, I'm already doing the Atticus Finch, Friar Lawrence thing. Friar Lawrence thing. I'll have that to you after lunch. Okay, Julia, because i got to be thinking about that. Yeah. We have yeah. other things to do, but apparently we, we're, we've given ourselves a sentence. We do. Um, yeah, and I think um, Wendy uh, would like to be the queen of the world. She's been going for it for a while. A long time. So if you could support and, um, it, you know, liking the podcast and subscribing would help towards that. It would. Um, but random calling. Oh, you were really going there today, huh? Yeah, girlfriend. Yeah, girlfriend. We, uh, when I, we do random calling, I feel like some of the questions that are asked are not higher order questions. <gasps> Yeah. And then there's no wait time and there's so much wrong with this situation. And I just, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, we're all kind of, yeah. Cause, it, Cause then you're asking yourself like, Oh, they are using random calling, but are, is the time they're spending using the random calling time well spent? Okay. So frankly, I would be happy if they just use random <laughs> I know, calling. I know, well, I know. what color was Juliet's dress? Okay. <laughs>
at, 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 it would be it would be an improvement. But I have I to know. say I, that that is an improvement, and I I know that. But I want I feel like we could use the power of random calling. So so okay. may I just talk about random calling first, and yes, then I'm giving YouTube, you the platform for you, random calling. Thank you. You two can. Launch, I told you I would. Uh, you can tell me you would, and I almost forgot about it. But I, if you thought I got passionate about jigsaw just you wait just people wait. buckle up um maybe i have to pull over right <laughs> you're listening true. to this in your car so i know I, a random calling was introduced to me many years ago when i was still in the classroom and and i count it as one of the top five things that changed my teaching uh and i began to use it all the time and i saw its power because prior to then, I only called on students who were raising their hands. And if they didn't raise their hands, well, they didn't want to answer. <laughs> and, and who was I to, to, force, them. to mm -hmm. force them to answer a question in my class? So what I first did with random calling, I know it's old school, but I did three by five cards. Yeah. I had them oh, do a name on the front of it. And then I got lots of information from them. I had them redo each quarter. I like so that. I would use it as a connecting uh -huh. activity. I think it's not old school. I think it's great. On mm -hmm. the back, I would have them write mm -hmm. their goals. And that way I could look at those easily and often. And if a student wasn't meeting them, it, it was an easy talking point. Um, but popsicle sticks are lovely. Mm -hmm. There are apps am i using that word correctly yeah. okay you can use a uh, playing cards which is it's kind of brit and julia's deal mm -hmm. what's important is that students um know that they could be called on at okay. any time which also should remind us that you don't pull a card or a popsicle stick and lay it to the side because <laughs> we, see a lot. We, we see a lot because like, oh, done. <laughs> if my stick is pulled, I'm like, woohoo, I am on vacation for I'm whatever remains out. of the class. Okay. That card has to go back in. You might get called, you know, during class, you might get called 12 times. You might not get called at all. My students used to say, that's not fair. And I would say, actually, it's the ultimate in fair. There is nothing fairer. Now, that being said, some teachers I've seen even recently use random calling as a gotcha. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I want to talk a little bit about random calling and anxiety. Yeah, so, so, oh, see, here we go. The podcast won't be long enough. You obviously go back to connect. Know your kids. Um, Sorry. You have to go back to connect. You have yeah. to know your you know your kids. That's you have to establish yes. a mm -hmm. classroom environment that mm -hmm. says, it's okay. I oh, always used to say to my students, right. I pull your stick, you don't know the answer, what we, happens? We figure it out. We there figure are multiple out. possibilities. Mm -hmm. right. I always used to say, no one, gotcha. mm -hmm. no one has died so far from in this classroom calling. from random calling. <laughs> Everybody has survived. Yes. And so I <laughs> survive random calling. Is right. that shirts? We should. Oh, when I retire, okay. I want all my former students to have okay. those shirts. All right. Um, so you establish that and you tell them, here's what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Yeah. I would tell littles okay, that. Don't hide it from This her. is not a secret. <laughs> you have to give wait time. Yes. And it's also a good idea to give talk time with a group uh -huh. or a brief writing and time. And that helps lessen mm -hmm. the anxiety. Too. And so yeah. then it's not so anxious. It's not so anxiety driven for students. I'm an introvert and people who know me, well, who don't really know me are shocked. Mm -hmm. I just want to sit in a corner. Don't ask me questions. If I'm interested, I'm going to learn. Yeah. If I'm not, there's nothing you can do about it. Right. That That's how I wanted to be as a student. But had random calling been used, had I known that that math teacher might be calling on me any minute, mm -hmm. but that he provided me time to think, to work with my peers to understand better. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that it was safe if you, and that after was safe, all of that, you still, still didn't know. It was yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. Life, life was all right. And I want to, can I just jump in on oh, the wait please, time really then, fast? Then yeah. I'm have have a a sip of coffee. And I want to go back to what I said earlier. The wait time is so important. Some kids have the freeway that they can recall the information or they can pull things yeah, together I mean, and in their brain. And some do. kids are on the surface streets. Yes. They have stoplights. They're stuck in traffic. They need the wait, wait time. time. 
They need the opportunity because they do have the answer. So it's, many of them. It's not it's about just, intelligence. Yes. It's just a matter of how they're pulling that information in their brain. And some of them just do it faster than others. Right. Sorry. See, no, don't be sorry. So all of the above. Um, I see teachers sometimes use random calling as a special occasion. Oh my, oh my <laughs> gosh, I just spit. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I used random calling when was the last time? I don't know, three weeks ago? No. Like, this is an culture. It's a classroom day. culture it's a thing. classroom culture. And yeah. It's an everyday deal. Now, I'll be honest, there are times and moments when, when I didn't use it, mm -hmm. but I didn't use it consciously for a very specific reason. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, those cards were just out and ready to go. So as Britt acknowledged at the beginning, if I were the queen of the world, if I were the superintendent of the school district, if I were the principal at your school, random calling would be a non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. Every single teacher would have to use it, use it correctly mm -hmm. and, and, and have that as, as the classroom culture. That's how much difference I think it could make. Yep. I also am passionate about equity. Mm -hmm. And really, this is the only true way to ensure equity. You're hearing from kids. Among your students. Mm -hmm. Not just the ones that raise their hands. Correct. And would you agree that there can be multiple types of random calling? Oh. Mm -hmm. So we can do random calling for what color is Juliet's dress, which is great because a lot of kids could answer that. But we could also do random calling with a higher order question. Oh, absolutely. Turn to a partner write something down, oh. you know, and then let's just, let's take a stab at it. And I just want teachers to see that it can be used as a powerful tool instead of this buzzword. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not a buzzword. And, and as we started out, and it should really not important. be a gotcha. And it doesn't, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be what color is, is Juliet's dress. Or what, okay, okay, question Brit, number one. What, who, okay, question number one. Sonia, what is it? Question number two, oh, Matthew. Oh, question oh, number three, oh. Johnny. Question yeah, number hurting, four, right? Hurting my heart. But they're random calling. But they are random calling. <laughs> yeah. So I we know. really, we okay. really Yay. need to. Woo but no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yay, woo -hoo for you, but no. So yeah, it is part of when we talk about intentional instruction, random calling is Isn't, intentional yeah. and it needs to be everywhere, but it needs to be used with intentionality. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so wrapping up, I think the last concept I really want to talk about is in our domain of instruct is student engagement. Um, and because I think a lot of teachers are like, I'm not here to put on a dog and pony show. Oh. I am not here to be in theater. I am here to disseminate information. And all I want to tell them is Google has done that job for you. Um, so what else do you get? Because they can Google pretty much anything and know um, what the answer is. Mm -hmm. So. Julia, yeah. what is the difference between student engagement and student participation? Uh, I always like to compare it to compliance, uh -huh. student compliance. Okay. Um, students will take notes if you tell them to take notes. Um, they will copy down what you're modeling on the board. Mm -hmm. um, that is participation. Anything that you ask them to do that doesn't require thought on their part mm -hmm. on their part or much thought on their part that's participation mm -hmm. uh, and it's not bad it's not bad kids it's a it's it, yeah it's a you necessary a component participation yep techniques. participation because techniques that really is the first step mm -hmm. into getting in the it's door the pathway to engagement right that can't yeah be the only. but you can't, but can't stay there yes. Right. yes and you can't mistake participation for engagement that and so the next piece then is once they're participating in, in the tasks that you're giving them, the next step is to get them thinking within those participation tasks. And that's where you get engagement. Mm -hmm. um, engagement is critical for student learning because we know that boredom takes them backwards. It's negative, is it 3-3 now? Mm -hmm. point three negative point three three. Um, and we're talking about Hattie's um, effect sizes. And so it is our job to engage them. And when we say entertaining kids, we're not entertaining them, we're mm -hmm. engaging and them. they mix those up uh, a lot. And we oh can do goodness. that by get, making it relevant to them. Yeah. We can do that by making, again, we, I go back to the example that I said earlier with Atticus Finch. You, yeah. can, you can go back to the page in the book and describe Atticus Finch and copy the answer. 
Mm -hmm. Or you can really process like, here's this quote yeah. by this president. And now here's this, this character that we've been reading about. And now I have to make connections between the two. That's way more engaging than me just going back and copying things from the text. So participation would be copying things. from the text. Yes. Participation would be copying things from the text. So you could give them choice, you know, more choice mm -hmm. will help engagement as yep. well. Um, yeah. So when we see students engaged, so we're watching a course. And if you're interested in active learning experiences, you need to go back, and I don't remember what the podcast number, but Julia has um, a whole episode with just uh, her and I on ALEs. Um, so we can you can go back and listen to active learning experiences, and she provides a lot of examples in that episode. But I want to talk about we're watching a class, we're observing a class. When we see engagement, what do we notice about the students first? A passion that they hate to admit is there. I know, right? <laughs> there is like they, no, they. I think some of the littles would totally be like, "Yeah, this is so cool." Yes, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, but as they yeah. get older, older, older students tend to be like, "Oops, I bet she saw me really smiling." <laughs> I smiled. But there's um, an energy yes, to engagement. Yes, 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 that, yes. And I don't. It's that, palpable. Yes, it, it really, it really is. Mm -hmm. palpable. I think for yeah. me, when I would see my, when I knew I had hit a, a good lesson mark, was when my students, some of my students would stand. It was so engaging. Mm -hmm. They literally they had to huddle over whatever Something. they were yes. doing mm -hmm. and move yeah. their body yeah. because they couldn't. They contain had the to energy. figure it out. Mm -hmm. They had to, they couldn't contain mm -hmm. their energy. They had to mm -hmm. do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I loved always seeing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and and it really can be felt. I'm I'm sort of struck by that right mm -hmm. now. But we visit so many classrooms, and when I walk in. I can feel a the classroom energy. where there's mm -hmm. true engagement, and it emanates from the teacher first. Mm -hmm. and I, I've never been into a classroom where the students were truly engaged and the teacher wasn't. Yeah. It, 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 you mm -hmm. can't have one without the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you can feel it, and it's not just an energy of, of kids busy. No. Mm -hmm. I walk into it's classrooms different. all the time. So no. when, when, when Julia was talking about compliance, when I, I used to teach a class about participation versus engagement and talked about an engagement ladder, and I don't remember all the steps now, but it talked about ritual compliance. Mm -hmm. And I talked about that some students are complying because their parents expect good grades or they're right. planning to go to college. And so they're doing the work. Tell me what I need to do to get. But yeah, so the, just, you that, know. Yeah. And then at the very bottom of the ladder, we have rebellion. Mm -hmm. Which is why when teachers call us out, we probably talked about this before, but when teachers or principals call us out to help someone with classroom management, it's almost always about instruction. Yeah. <laughs> almost yeah, always, always about instruction. instruction. Yeah. And that's why, because the students, we were talking mm -hmm. about boredom, uh -huh. the students are so bored, and I hate that word, but there's no other word, they get naughty. Mm -hmm. And so students from the bottom rungs are either naughty or asleep. <laughs> Those are the two options. Yeah. Above that, you have that ritual, like, I, I know how to play the school game. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's engagement. And when there's a oh, true engagement, it is mm -hmm. exciting. So oh, you touched on this. So we see it with the students. We feel the energy. What do we notice about the teacher in, the, in that classroom? She's, get to, go she's ahead. tired at the end of the day, but so filled with adrenaline. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you think? Sometimes because truly engaging tasks can't be predicted uh -huh. how oh. they're going to go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sometimes the teacher can look like the scientist watching an experiment happen. Absolutely. Right. Just that awe of like going from group to group yep. or... Mm -hmm. or pair to pair, student to student, just watching. There's this very fascinated, the, the teacher's engaged in his or her own way in watching what the students are doing. Yep. Um, and and so, it can't be predicted. No, no. And okay. I think that's what makes it so powerful. It shouldn't be able to be predicted. Right. My favorite lessons, and you hit the nail on the head when you said that the teacher is also engaged, were the things that were completely unpredictable um, to me and to the students. Um, and we would throw questions at them all the time or activities that we never know if they would land or not. And, um, but we thought they would 
be mm -hmm. interesting. And I would get called over. It was like I was in this middle of a tornado of positive, interesting, mm -hmm. even at times frustrated, but not in a mad way, but just mm -hmm. inquisitive. And I had to be the knowledge person. Like they were asking me to clarify. And mm -hmm. if I couldn't, I would have to pull up a chair and I would, or bend down. I love that though. They love that. And that's yeah. what I would see. If I look in a classroom that is student engagement, the, the lesson design and the instruction has happened in such a way that the teacher is no longer up at the front or mm -hmm. at the desk or oh. they are literally with the students. They're collaborators. They're, They're collaborators, collaborators in the learning process. Mm -hmm. right? And not always right. Like I would tell the kids like, oh, I didn't think about that. Hold on. I gotta think. Oh, yeah, they love that. And yeah, love and then and we would like too. go back and forth on ideas, and then we would finally land on something, and we'd hit something mark, and then I would go to the next group, and like, yes, I was tired. My brain was kind of tired at the end of, end of the day, but I was. But it's adrenaline. Mm -hmm. It was like like a fulfilling, right? mm -hmm. and I think that's where we need to go with instruction. Is students need to be doing the thinking. Students need to be doing a lot of the. I, not the work, but you know what I'm saying? It doesn't mean that the, I think there's been a misconception with though, that. There's been, and yes. it came from Harry Wong. If that, if yes, the teacher's doing Wong. it, and I love Harry Wong, wherever mm -hmm. he is, I think he's still alive. But <laughs> if he's, you know, the student should be tired, not the teacher. No, no, I'm, no, I'm that's sorry. not what I'm saying. Teaching is it's tiring, tiring. Mm -hmm. but it means that you are not the only one. The teacher isn't yes. the only one doing the hefty living. You're doing lifting you're doing the hefty lifting and my together. cup is full yeah i think if a teacher feels like they're doing all the work and their cup is empty mm -hmm. that's when we get burnout yeah that is a true statement so i wanted to say like they're the t the kids are doing the thinking and they're doing a lot of the engaging but then the teachers are too right. but it, it's filling their teacher cup mm -hmm. right and i think that's at the end of the day right. what really good instruction will look like when you walk into a room so uh uh a misconception that I encountered when I first became the instructional specialist at my school in Mesa, I would go into classrooms and, and I was advised to just drop into classrooms and everybody knew me. It was not a big deal, but I would come in sometimes and a teacher would say to me, today's not a good day. Oh, I'm not teaching. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, what's happening? Oh, well, the kids are working on um, this jigsaw and they're reading this text. And I'm like, that's a perfect yeah, that's, I do not want to see you, you standing in front of the room talking. Yeah. That was the definition of teaching. Mm -hmm. I'm not teaching like today. That. Yeah. Every single day you should be teaching, but right. that doesn't equate to lecture. So you're going to love this next question. Are you ready for rapid fire? Oh, yes. And I have not I read the rapid fire questions. Okay. I promise. I'm so Whoever wants to go first, you guys could go off back, back and forth. I don't so care. the first one is instruction must be blank. So I'm trying to think of something clever and creative. I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to go with the predictable one, engaging. It has to be engaging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, I'm still pondering all kinds of deep thoughts. I know. Which is why I, I, I mean. But I want to pose this to you, but I also want anybody listening to be thinking of their answer as well. Right. Because I really so in instruction must be. must be. So I I, I agree with you. Oh, absolutely. Engage it one hundred percent. Must be about the student learning. Mm -hmm. Must be student centered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. All right. On a scale of one to ten, ten being super often, how often do you see random calling being used in classrooms? Three or four. One or two. I would say three or th probably, yeah, two or three. Yeah, it's and, low. And it's it low. Me, yeah. And it makes me want to cry. Yep. And yeah. we already talked about it. So I want people to really know it's a big deal. It's mm -hmm. a huge, mm -hmm. huge, huge okay. deal. If you don't believe me, call me. Name one of the seven dwarfs <gasps> and then relate his name to good instruction. <laughs> I'm <thinking. laughs> I'm going to go with bashful. Okay. Isn't that one? I'm trying to remember. Yes. Okay. Wendy's looking at me like, what planet really? are you from? <laughs> is that a good higher order question? That's that is a, a good awesome higher order question. question. You okay, are so welcome. I'm going to go with bashful. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm going to talk about how when we design, when we're intentional with instruction, we are creating those active learning experiences that brings those bashful students out of their shells, that allows them the opportunity to feel like they can participate in the learning because there's so many different ways for them to be active in the learning um, that meets their needs or meets them where they are as well. Okay, I may be using this question in my next classes. Thank you, absolutely <laughs> love it. Thanks, Britt. You're welcome. Um, I can't name all seven dwarfs, but the first one, that, I'm, I'm going to be honest, yes. the first one that came to me was dopey. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then I couldn't come up with any of the other ones. I'm like, what are the names <laughs> of the other seven dwarfs? Dopey, 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 dopey. <laughs> and, and so... So I'm going to have to think about that later, about their names. Sleepy. But then I'm, oh, well, yeah, don't go there because that's the that's worst we've been lately. Yes. Uh -huh. um, so dopey, relating that to instruction. Um, we cannot be dopey. And I'm still seeing teachers who oh, whose hearts are... Are good and they they want to do it right and, oh, and, and dopey they, is good hearted and, and they nature. think they've been doing it right for the last fifty years, um, but instruction it is more like doc mm -hmm. than dopey. Mm -hmm. um, oh, she just remembered one. She I remembered say. one. Yeah. I did. And sleepy reminded me of how I remember what you said a minute ago. What bashful. <laughs> bashful. Okay, and Happy. I would also I would also say grumpy. Yep, grumpy yeah. is one. But really, dopey. Instruction is not about being dopey. It's about being clear-headed, mm -hmm. clear-hearted, clear vision yeah. for what you want from your, your students. Would you agree that we have all types of dwarfs in our classes and that <gasps> we need to make sure our instruction is mm -hmm. fitting? Mm -hmm. And that way we, we don't have a sleepy or a grumpy. Or I'm mm -hmm. now yeah. going to be thinking about okay, all so sorry. students <laughs> in terms of the seven dwarfs. The seven dwarfs. You have ruined me You're for gonna the entire this last day. One. Okay. So who is your first celebrity crush? Jean-Luc Picard. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I love this. I knew if it. you know and me. I knew this answer. Yes. So that's why I Patrick Stewart and I was oh my gosh when I was watching Star Trek Next Generation I was young I was like eight or nine mm -hmm. years old and I I don't know just he was so smart mm -hmm. and he was the I don't know oh it's so you yeah I know it's it is so it you. is so me okay girl oh my goodness I'm thinking of all the posters that were up in my room <laughs> uh -huh. people on YouTube probably don't even know um Okay, for sure, Donnie Osmond. That uh -huh. was probably the very, very, is. very, very first. <laughs> I mean, come on, it was Donnie. But then when I got just a little bit older and a little bit more rebellious, yeah. uh, David Cassidy. Yeah, uh -huh. uh -huh. Oh, yeah. David oh, yeah. Cassidy with the hair. Yeah. And, uh -huh. Oh, yeah. 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 I can see that. Because it was like the bad boy, Donnie Osmond. Uh -huh. So those were the first ones. And last question. Using your best Elmo voice. You don't know who Elmo is? Yeah, I mean, he's like I, orange, I got, right? I got this one covered. He's You're good. orange? Isn't he's he red. orange? He's red. Oh, he's red. Yeah. Okay, Julia's going to go first, and then you have to go. She's going to model good teaching for you. Okay, can and she then... make a clarity map for me on <laughs> Elmo? And I first have to define okay. Elmo. No, so yes, okay. that's yeah. that would be your starting out. Okay. So using your best Elmo voice, tell me how you like your coffee. La, 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 lots of Splenda. <laughs> I need way more instruction <laughs> than that. How about you want me to do me West? Can I do my West? You can do your May West. Go for it. You can see me sometime. That one. I like my coffee. Dark. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. I haven't done May West in a long time, and I sure as heck can't do Elm. I love all of that, and that I don't even know I'm going re <laughs> to start to teach. All right, whatever I'm supposed to do today, mentor other people. Okay. All right, listeners, if you would like to learn more from these two lovely ladies. <laughs> I'm trying to get through this. You, you can find them um, at wendy.peterson at gilbertschools.net and julia.peterson. Julia. <laughs> Sorry. Julia All right, Kelsey we're breaking down. At Um, And uh, thank you guys so much for coming on today. <laughs> we're breaking down.
We're all crying Wait, laughing. Don't break your glasses. Elma. Would you like me to do my Elmo voice again? No. <laughs> oh, gosh. All um, right. We are signing off, and um, our next episode will be on um, Assess. So if you're looking for things about assessment and how to do informal and informative assessment and summative assessments, that's what our, our new, next episode will be on. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Learning Unlocked and finding out more about quality instruction with your students um, and having some more clarity, uh, intentionality, and engagement. I know the end there, we, we got a little kooky. I think the coffee and the sugar rush kicked in, um, but honestly, uh, it's like being a fly on our, in the wall in our PLC in our office. That pretty much is how we talk to each other about education, but there's also a lot of fun, and I hope that for all of you as well in your professional learning communities. If you've listened today as a GPS educator, you can receive PD recertification credit by visiting our employee hub page and navigating to professional growth and then digital PD courses. Just a reminder that we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at GPS Prof Growth. That's at GPS P-R-O-F G-R-O-W-T-H. For more information or resources from this episode, please visit our website at learningunlocked.lipson.com forward slash website. We are distributed by Lipson to Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and Audible. Episodes are also available on our YouTube channel under playlists. Our intro and outro music are licensed from Melody Loops. And of course, if you have time to give us a rating on Apple Podcasts, we would appreciate it. The more ratings we get, the more views will be seen by teachers around the world. Thanks again, key holders. You keep unlocking that curiosity, creativity, and innovation with your students. Stay kind and courageous and have a little bit of laughter and I'll see you next time.